Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today, as we enter with Jesus into Holy Week, is what St. Paul writes in Philippians, 2, chapter, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here ends the reading, and we pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The crowds who welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday shouted with joy, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The crowds were right to shout this about Jesus because he had indeed come to them in the name of the Lord. But as the crowds shouted this, they would not have thought that Jesus himself was the Lord. After all, Jesus looked and sounded like a man. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey just like any other man would have. The God, of whom they had read in the writings of the Old Testament prophets, wasn't anything like Jesus. So, Jesus couldn't be God. Instead, he was simply a righteous man who was intent on doing God's will. Or at least, that's what the people would have thought. But, as those who welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday should have known, things are not always what they seem. If we want to really understand what was happening on that first Palm Sunday, and then on the days that followed it, we need to pay attention to what St. Paul tells us in our epistle lesson today. The first thing we heard in these verses is that St. Paul is talking about Christ Jesus, the Word made flesh, the one born of the Virgin Mary who had both a human nature and a divine nature. St. Paul doesn't tell us all of that here, but it's assumed that those who are reading or hearing these words already know that. And this is important. Because when St. Paul says that Christ was originally in the form of God, he is talking about Jesus after he was conceived, not just as the second person of the Trinity before the Incarnation. This is what St. Paul is saying, that at the Incarnation, when the eternally begotten Son of God became Mary's human son, at that moment, Jesus was fully using and fully showing all his divine power and glory. Because he wasn't born yet, all of this power and glory was not yet hidden underneath the humble shell of his human body. Jesus Christ, without ceasing to be God, became a man. He was not yet in the full form of a man, but he was in the form of God. This is one of those things that we cannot completely wrap our minds around. How in the world was Jesus showing all his divine power and glory when he wasn't even the size of a penny in his mother's womb? But this is what St. Paul says. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. When Paul writes that Christ did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, this does not mean that he was reaching out and trying to grab something that was not already his. What St. Paul does mean is that Christ, who was fully God and fully man in one person, had, for the sake of our salvation, made the decision to not hold on to this equality with God in a full and obvious way. In order to be the savior of the world, Christ had to let this go. He assumed an existence in which he was equal, not with God, but with all human men and women of the earth. 
for the sake of being able to live as we live and to die as we die as our substitute, Christ embraced our humiliation. Now, as we hear that, maybe we're thinking that doesn't make much sense. Even though the confirmation students do argue with me on this, we are all human beings, and this does not seem to be that humiliating. But remember what Jesus was coming from into this equality with us. He was God, and even after he became a man, he was still God. So even though being a human doesn't seem that bad to us as we sit here in church today, imagine if the saving will of God demanded that you become an ant or a slug. That would be awful, but that would not even compare to what it was like for Christ to become one of us. And of course, Jesus did not humble himself in this way only in life. But as St. Paul goes on to say, he humbled himself in this way by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. If Jesus had not been willing to do this, if he had remained only the fully divine equal to God, then Jesus could not have taken our place underneath the law. This is because God's law has to do with human beings. It is meant to guide and regulate our lives, which means that in order to truly follow it, one has to be a human being. So that's what Jesus became. He humbled himself to become someone who was under God's law and could truly keep it according to the same circumstances that were supposed to keep it. But unlike us, Jesus actually did this. He always did what God's law told him to do, and he never did what God's law told him not to do. And through this perfect obedience, Jesus did something else that we haven't done. He earned a place for himself in heaven. But Jesus did not cash in on this for his own personal benefit. Instead, he put his righteousness to work for another purpose, offering himself to God in the place of every other human being who has ever lived. Jesus was able to do this because he didn't have any sins for which he had to pay. He was the only person to whom God's wrath for sin did not apply. So as the one and only perfect human being, Jesus was willing to take onto himself the sin and guilt of every other human being and to die for them in our place on the cross. This suffering and death was the atonement. Jesus didn't do all this, becoming a man, keeping the law perfectly, and then dying in our place to show us how to live our lives or to show us how to have a heartfelt relationship with God. He did this to pay for our sins and to free us from the death and banishment from God that we with our sins deserve. None of this would have been possible if Jesus had not endured the humiliation of becoming our human brother. But Jesus did humble himself as this way. As the divine and human savior of the world, he did and endured everything he needed to to make possible the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal salvation. It's important for us to remember that the mere act of becoming a man is not what was so humiliating for Jesus. Jesus is still a man, and he's not humble at all. The thing that was humiliating for Jesus was that to be our Savior, he had to let go of his equality with God. And that includes not always fully using all of his divine power and glory. Of course, there were times during his life when Jesus still did use these powers because they hadn't been taken away from him. But for the most part, certainly not for his own sake, but for ours, Jesus was just like us. However, this is no longer the case. There is no longer any need for Jesus to be limited in all the ways that we are limited. Jesus is still a man, but now his human nature has fully taken on and fully uses all the power and glory of his divine nature. Having done what he was born as a man to do, Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God the Father, where he is still our Savior, and he is still presenting the proofs of this to the Father, the holes in his hands and feet inside as the ongoing basis for our being forgiven of our sins and promised every blessing in Christ. 
the eternally begotten Son of God, who was exalted in this way, is not someone who used to be Jesus. Jesus still has everything given to him by his mother, Mary. Jesus is still the Jesus of the Bible. He will always be this Jesus, the Savior and the friend of sinners. St. Paul writes, Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So maybe nepotism isn't so bad after all. You and I now have a relative and friend in the highest of places with the greatest of power. Jesus Christ, who is and always will be our human brother, is now seated at the right hand of God, which means there is no limit to what he can do for us. Jesus is able to give us everything we need for the struggles of life and for our walk of faith. And if Jesus does not give us something we've asked him for, that's not because he isn't able to give it. It must be that Jesus knows we need something else, and he's giving that to us instead. Jesus gives us everything we need. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us the guidance and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Jesus still gives us himself. He is able to do this because the right hand of God the Father is everywhere and nowhere. It is not limited to one single or number of places on earth or in the universe. So when the word of God tells us that Jesus is with his church, protecting it and taking care of it, then that is exactly where Jesus is and what he is doing. He doesn't have to be in one place, doing one thing at a time. Jesus can do and be whatever and wherever he wants. And he has told us in the gospel that he wants to be with us. He has promised that he feeds us spiritually and physically with his own true body and blood in the supper. Jesus reaches out and he touches us in these ways because he can and because he knows that we need him to, because he is our human brother. Jesus comes to us and is present with us in these ways just as truly and really for the same reason why he came to Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. So as we welcome Jesus today and even every day of our lives, we do so believing in him and rejoicing in him. Jesus has come as God and man to do what only one who was God and man could do, to save us from our sins. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.